Take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me. And because I, I have enough. Question, anybody in here that you could say, honestly, I have enough? This, there, there's, another, there's another message. There's a difference between complacency and contentment. Complacency is when you have no ambition, you have no goals, you've just settled in mediocrity. Contentment is I believe that God has more for me, but even if he never does anything else for me, he's already done enough and I am complete. I have enough in him. I dare say you don't start living until you find yourself complete in God. Jacob said, I have, I have enough. So he urged him and he took it, 12. Then Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and the herd which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before the servant. In other words, Esau said, hey brother, let's do life together. And Jacob said, ah, you go on ahead. I'll catch up later. I know you love me and you've forgiven me, but last time I saw you, you wanted to kill me. So forgive me if I don't trust you. You go on ahead and I'll catch up afterwards. And Esau said, well, at least let me leave with you some of the men, the people who are with me. But Jacob said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. In other words, yes, I love your brother, but you go on ahead. Let's slow this reconciliation thing down a little bit. Father God, we're grateful that you're here. We're here. You're going to speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Before you sit down, tell two people the title of my message, which is Don't Negotiate with Emotional Terrorist. Come on, tell somebody, tell somebody, tell somebody. This is an easy answer question, and you just shout yes at the end of it. Have you guys enjoyed this series 70 times 7? Good. I am a, I'm a needy preacher, so sometimes I'll just throw stuff in there for you to say yes and amen. I've been blessed more than probably you in this series just because God has been dealing with me on this issue of unforgiveness and bitterness. I've discovered that it's impossible to move forward in all that God has for you, anchored to tragedy from the past. You are either going to release the past or you are gonna forfeit the future. I've had a week off, I'm ready to rumble. You are either gonna say, I am gonna release that or you're gonna release your future. But God intentionally did not give you the capacity to hold on to bitterness and hope at the same time. God did not give you the capacity to hold on to guilt and purpose at the same time. At some point, you're going to need to forgive them, and you're going to need to forgive yourself and allow yourself to move forward in all that God has for you. Somebody say amen. amen. One of the issues with forgiveness for believers, though, is that we have sometimes bought into the confusion that forgiveness and reconciliation is the same thing when they are not the same thing. The Bible says that we are required by God to forgive. Otherwise, God is not able to forgive us. Unforgiveness is actually a sin. The Bible says this, that, that God remembers our sins no more. God has forgiven us to the point where he remembers our sins no more. Now, that's a good verse, but it doesn't make any sense because God is all-knowing. And if God is all-knowing, it's impossible for him not to know. It's impossible for him to forget. If God could forget, he wouldn't be all-knowing. And because he's all-knowing, he can't forget, which means the Bible says he's remembered my sins no more, but he hasn't forgotten them. So how can God remember my sins no more, but yet he hasn't forgotten them? This is what that word remember means. It means that God has made a conscious decision not to bring up your past. When he says, I remember your sin no more, what he's saying is, I'm not going to bring that up anymore. 
I'm not going to throw that in your face anymore. I'm not going to treat you based on the, that, that mistake. I'm going to treat you based on how we are moving forward together. Somebody say he's preaching already. Which means for me as a follower of God that forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a decision. Some of you are waiting to feel like forgiving someone, and I'm going to let you know, you're not going to feel it until you do it. You don't need to feel like forgiving your father for not being there when you needed him. You don't need to forgive your mother for constantly comparing you to your siblings. You don't need to, for, you, you don't need to feel it. You just need to do it. You need to make a conscious decision. I'm going to remember that no more. I'm not going to bring it up. When you call me, I'm not going to click over. When you call me, I'm not going to talk out the side of my mouth. I'm not going to give you the side eye. I'm not going to respond like what you want right now. I don't trust you. I'm not going to bring that up anymore. That's what forgiveness is. Reconciliation is a whole different ballgame. Reconciliation is not that I've forgiven you, but now we're doing life together. I'm going to let you move back in. I'm going to share my dreams and my visions with you. I'm going to rely on you. I'm going to lean on you. I'm going to support you and expect you to support me. And that's a whole different ballgame. It's one thing to release somebody. It's a completely different thing to allow them back into your journey. The Bible says to forgive everyone, but to be intentional about who you do life with. The Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. So what I want to talk to you about today is who gets let back in and who, no, I forgive you, but you do you and I'm going to do me. In this passage that we're reading about Jacob and Esau, Jacob is making his way back to Esau after Esau screamed at him, next time I see your face, I will kill you. Now, it may sound like Esau had anger problems, which he did, but if you understood the story, you would understand that Esau had very good reason to want to kill Jacob. Jacob was a twin of Esau, but he was born second. He came out second. He, he came out as a fighter. The Bible says that he was holding on to the heel of his older brother as he, any, I get in trouble, any siblings in here? You love your brother, you love your sister, but there's just a little bit inside of you like you ain't going to get ahead of me. Like, I don't know, I have four of us, I have one of my brothers right in the front row, and, and we're, we're just a little competitive. Just a little bit. Like, we'll go out to Froyo and our wives and all that kind of stuff, and we, we you know, you, you, you make, you ever been to Froyo, you Froyo, right? Y'all know Froyo. You look at me like, you know, this is spiritual, trust me, it's spiritual. I only do the vanilla ice cream or the yogurt, you vanilla, and you put wet walnuts on the strawberries, and then you put a little bit of, um, what, what do you call it, little cookies, cookie dough, cookie dough, and all this kind of stuff. So making, and then I look over my brother Daniel, and his is a little bit higher, so I put a little bit more in mine. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I look at my other brother, and he has sprinkles on his, so I got sprinkles on mine. It's just like, not even your froyo is going to be better than mine. And we sit down, and we eat the froyo, and then it's all done, and, and, and he says, hey, I'll take the trash. I'm like, no, I'll take the trash, because I'm more of a gentleman than you. I can me that now we're fighting over the trash to see who's gonna put it in because it's just like you just get you can't let family get ahead it's just a sibling thing let's just say amen Daniel thank you it's just kind of so when Jacob came out he was holding on to the heel of Esau and he says you may be first but you're not gonna step on top of me and what happened is while oh the Bible says that Jacob was the one that God blessed he said out of Jacob I'm gonna make make a great nation the only problem is God took longer to move in Jacob's life than Jacob wanted God to. So after Jacob hit his limit of waiting on God, he took matters into his own hands. And he began to manipulate to try to create what God had already promised him. So Jacob's father was dying, and it was the custom of those days when a man died that he would call his sons and that he would speak a blessing over the son. The firstborn son would get two-thirds of the blessing. you got to understand, blessing wasn't just words. It was... Tracking with me? I, I was reading an article this week about the wealthiest man in, in uh, India. His name is Mukesh Ambani. He is worth $40.1 billion dollars. 
After I read that article, I began to pray for his salvation, that God would move in his heart, move him to Columbia, Maryland, and that he could begin to tithe at Destiny Church. I was pr Y'all praying with me? Dude is loaded. He has the most expensive house in the world. It's a 27-story apartment that only him and his family live in. <laughs> That's just ignorant. So the article was talking about his wealth, and then there was this little article about now he actually has access to his wealth after a 10-year legal battle with his little brother. I'm like, oh. Apparently, before it was his company, it was Pop's company, and Dad died without a will. So ever since the dad died, these two brothers have been battling it out in court and probably outside of court, trying to figure out who's going to get, and the older brother won. Well, that's what Jacob and Esau were fighting over, $40.1 billion of inheritance. And because Jacob didn't think that God could bless him, he snuck into his dad's room pretending to be Esau and tricked his father into giving Jacob the firstborn blessing. And when Esau came in there and said, Dad, bless me, his dad said, I'm sorry, I have nothing left for you. So that's the context in which Jacob is coming back to reconcile with Esau. There's this random thing that we do, it's called pride. <laughs> and what pride does is it makes every time we listen to a message, pride requires us to listen to the message as the victim. I promise you, when I started this message about reconciliation, you automatically thought about the people who did you wrong. That's why I wrote the message, because I was thinking about the people who did me wrong. We're in the same boat, singing together. But what if you're the offender? Esau was not the offender. Jacob was the thief. Jacob was the one that was coming back to his brother after robbing him of all of his father's wealth. It's a whole different ballgame at that point. I want to give you three thoughts, three thoughts of how to reconcile with the right people in your life. Now, some people, look, that coworker that lied about you and, you know, no, just forgive them, go on. You don't need it in your life, just move on. But there's certain people that they are integral part for you fulfilling the destiny that God has for you. And I believe that there are some of us who have convinced ourselves that we don't need certain people in our lives to accomplish what God's called us to accomplish, and that's not true. Well, my family's crazy. I don't need them. Let's just move on. No, God placed you in that family for a purpose. And yes, part of them is crazy. By the way, you got that part. If you don't believe me, ask your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your sister, your brother. They'll tell you. It's in the eyes. You look them in the eyes. <laughs> but listen to me. I don't care if you were born to a family of serial killers. It's not all bad. Like, you have driven people in your family. <laughs> Whatever it is, God connected you to that family, to certain covenant relationships on purpose, and it wasn't your mom or your dad, your brother or your sister. It was the devil himself that worked in between the two of you to break that relationship apart because he knew that you would not be able to fulfill all that God had for you in your life without them. Don't get in your mind, I don't need. You know, we sing these, these songs back in the day. They got that song, you know, as oh, long as I got King Jesus, as long as I got King Jesus, long, long, long as I don't need no. And they start talking about no doctor, no lawyer. No, you need a doctor. You need a lawyer, and King Jesus is not enough to get you where you need to go. Get yourself in a connect group. You need more than just King Jesus. So what I want to talk about is how do I reconcile with those people that are divine covenant relationships, that they're actually integral to me fulfilling what God. First thing is just write this down. Take the first step. Take, take the first step. I figured preaching about Jacob and Esau, I might as well preach about me and my brothers. I, I, I was telling Zai, and, and I don't know how much she was listening to me because she, she hasn't slept in seven days, and she has this glazed look over her eyes. I'm just like, are you okay? And she, I'm like, she's not okay. But I was trying to explain to her that, 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 that she's had a son now. And sons are a little different. Zoe, oh my gosh, Zoe's an angel. She puts her new outfit on and she comes up to daddy and she says, 
<laughs> and she does this little spin. And every time I see her, I say, Zoe, you are so beautiful. I tell her that because I'm, I'm preparing her for when she's 16, 17, 18, 19, and some little jerk comes up and says, Zoe, you are so beautiful. I want her to respond, I know that. Tell me something I haven't heard before. It's my goal. So she'll come and she'll dance and all this kind of stuff. I said, Zoe, you are beautiful. But the only problem is I underestimated Zoe. So now at 19 months, she's like, I know. <laughs> We're praying for her humility. Boys are a different ballgame. Boys, they don't come and they don't prince and prance. They're not interested about your, your, their outfit. Boys say, hey, mommy, look at this spider that I found outside. <laughs> mommy, I found a raccoon outside. Look at it. Here, here. This is just kind of how boys are. And I was trying to prepare his eyes. I said, listen, now that you have a son, it's going to be a little different. There's going to be holes in the wall. It's just part of having a son. We go through drywall. It's just what we do. Me, me and my brothers, I'm the oldest son, and then I have two younger brothers, and, and we just kind of were all in that teenage stage together. We're kind of close in age. And from about 10 to 18, honest to goodness, more fun than college, some of the best years of my life. You have not played tackle football <laughs> until you play football in a 10 by 20 foot basement with cement floors and metal poles in the middle of the room. You have not gotten tackled until you get tackled into a metal pole. And then both of your brothers jump on you, holding your mouth. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Mommy's going here, don't cry, don't cry. As your brain is, you think the NFL has concussion problems? Try growing up with brothers. You're gonna know what concussions are all about. And then when mom would finally hear somebody crying, she would come and take our Nerf ball and go upstairs. But she didn't know that's what we had the cardboard basketball hoop for. And we had scotch tape it to the wall. And it'd be a cross between roller jam, WWF, and basketball until finally the game was over. How do you know a game is over with boys? It's not when the score changes. It's not when dinner is ready. It's when somebody's crying. It's not over until somebody's crying. Somebody's crying and my dad would come down, my mom would come down, what's happening? He did this, we're not playing football, we're playing basketball, I don't know why he body slammed me or whatever it may be. And we're kind of going back and forth and I would hate these moments because my dad or my mom, they would say, Stephen, apologize. <laughs> I don't appreciate the discrimination in this house. I, I, why? Why do you weren't here? Why do you think I'm the one who put my brother through the wall? Why would that be the, besides the fact that he has plaster on his face and I don't? Why is that the assumption? And they would always give me this response and I would hate it. They would say, Stephen, you need to apologize because you're the oldest. <clears throat> It was this idea of because you went first, you were the most responsible for reconciliation. Listen, you have to take the first step. Why? Because you're the believer. It doesn't matter if you're the one who was the offended or the offender. It doesn't matter who started it. Because of the blood of Jesus on your life, because King Jesus calls you his son and calls you his daughter, you now have the obligation. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, blessed. This is a rhetorical question. There's only one answer to it, so everybody just say amen. amen. How many people in here want to be blessed? I set you up. You, 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 half the room missed it. Let's just try that again. Let me make it a little better. How many people want to be blessed by God? Yes. Well, the Bible says blessed are the peacemakers. Part of your blessing is tied up in the fact that you don't get to wait for them to come to you. You have to go to them. The Bible says blessed are the peacemakers. For why? They're called the children of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says this, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin. Anybody grateful that God doesn't count how many times you mess up anymore? Anybody grateful that he does not hold that on your record anymore? What does it mean to be a Christian? What it means to be a Christian is if you look at my rap sheet, it is blank. It's so funny. My rap sheet is like a mile long, but there's nothing printed on it. 
Why is it so long? If there's nothing, it should be one sheet. No, it's so long because there used to be a whole lot of stuff on there. But it's blank because he's erased it. He no longer holds my sin against me. He said he gave us. Somebody say, that's me. Look how the Bible says it. The wonderful message of reconciliation. Part of the fact that you're a believer means that God has anointed you to bring things back together. Not to say it's not my problem, I have nothing to do with it. No, 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 it's your job to take the first step. So without waiting for Esau to do anything, Jacob started going towards his brother. You gotta understand how intimidating it must have been. The Bible says that Jacob sent some of his servants to Esau to say, hey, I'm coming. By the way, it's always great to announce your, your, your return before actually showing up. You don't want to surprise people. <laughs> hey, um, let's go out for coffee. I'd love for us to talk about our relationship. It sets them up. It lets them know, like, you're paying for coffee, but we're going <laughs> to work this out. And he sent his servants to Esau and says, hey, go tell them I'm coming home. Mind you, they haven't seen each other in 20 years. Last time we saw him, I'm going to kill you, is what he said. So he sends his servant, and the servant goes and tells Esau, and then the servant comes back. And you, can you just imagine Jacob just wringing his fingers as that servant was out there, just like, man, what is he going to say? What is he going to do? And, and, and the servant came back, and Jacob's like, that's good. He didn't kill my servant. That must be like something, you know, good is happening. And the servant came by, and Jacob's like, what did he say? What did he say? And the servant said, he didn't say anything. It's easy when somebody says they hate you. It's easy when somebody says they love you. It's very difficult when they say, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, what is that? Like, are we, what? He said, he didn't say anything. And Jacob said, what did he do? He, he went and got a sword. To polish it? No, he put it, he, he put, he put it on. Ooh. What did he do after that? He went outside and called 400 of his warriors. And they got on their horses and they started riding this way. <laughs> so here is Jacob obeying God who told him to go make up with his brother. And here is his brother riding at him in full military gear with 400 warriors. Can you imagine how f afraid Jacob was? And here comes Esau with his soldiers and Jacob sees him. And the Bible is so ignorant. Or maybe the people in the Bible, you got to read it. First of all, Jacob had four wives, which the Bible said not to do, but that's a side story. <laughs> and what Jacob did is he lined up all his wives and their children in the order of which ones he liked the most. That is ignorant. So his favorite wife, he put her in the back. If we're going to die, she'll die last. The second favorite wife, she was third. The third favorite, she was second. Could you imagine being the chick who was up front? <laughs> If he don't kill you, I will. We're going to deal with this. At least he was man enough to stand in front of his entire family. And here comes Esau with his soldiers. And this is just me. You can interpret the scripture however you want. I think Esau was coming to kill him. I think Esau had held a grudge for 20 years and was coming to make good on a promise. And here comes Esau riding. And as he's riding, Jacob walks before Esau and he kneels. And he says, my Lord, my servant. Dan, come, 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 come here, Dan. This, this is my brother. Go around. This, this is my brother. I didn't plan this. He didn't even know I'm doing this. How, how's it going, Dan? Do you love me? Don't answer that. There's people watching. <laughs> Just a quick, 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 quick question. Yes. Would you ever call me Lord? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> he just lied. I'm not going to ask you, do you feel like my servant? Because you work for me. So I'm going to leave that one. <laughs> he gets on his knees and he says, brother, my Lord, and I'm your servant. And he gets up and he walks a few more steps and he kneels again and he says, my Lord, I am your servant. And here, the Bible says he did it seven times. And this is just me. I think Esau was riding towards Jacob. I'm going to kill you, man. <laughs> and the first time that he kneeled, he was like, nah, Holmes, you're not getting off that easy. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and then the second time he kneeled, he's like, I'm going to hurt you, man. 
And by the fifth and sixth and seventh time, I'm going to kill you, turn to, I miss you, man. <laughs> because the humility of Jacob turned the heart of Esau. Yeah. When the believer in the story didn't come back saying, you did this to me, and, and you, you ever had one of them sideways apologies? You know how people talk about, like, I'm so sorry you were offended. <laughs> what they're really saying is, I'm so sorry you're so sensitive and emotional. <laughs> Taking no responsibility for what they did. You know how people say, you know, I'm really sorry that I yelled and called you out your name, but it's when you said this, it, you pushed me there. When you take the first step, don't take the first step for justice. Take the first step in humility. Reconciliation only happens when some person decides, I'm going to lift the other person up. A marriage never comes back together when two people stake their claim. You, you never get back on the same page with a sister or a brother or a confidant when you say, this far, no further. It only happens when you take the attitude of it's not about me. Look at this. In verse 11, he said this. Please take my blessing. This is him when he's finally talking to his brother. And he lavished him with goats and sheep and just gave him all this stuff and money. It was Esau's anyway. He just stole it. But anyway, he's giving it back. And he's, he said, take all of this. And he says, please take my blessing and brought to you. Watch this. And here's the only way you can respond to somebody in humility. He said, because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says this. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Don't miss this. The only way you will ever be able to walk in humility is when you come to a place in life where you realize that all I need is not found in a person, is not found in somebody else, but it is found in God. It is him that I live and move and have my being. So when I get down on my knees, come up here. I'm just having fun. When I get down on my knees in front of my brother, I'm still older than him. Me, on, <laughs> me honoring him, me celebrating what God is doing in his life doesn't diminish what God is doing in my life because it's not based on other people. It's based on God yeah. called me. He's using. Yeah. Thank you. Somehow we can't humble ourselves before other people because we feel like it makes us less than. The only way another person can make you less than is if your identity was found in them. But when you liking me doesn't change me, when you celebrating doesn't hold me back, when you thinking I can do it or not doesn't make a difference to me, it allows me to honor you what if we were people that weren't so needy? What if we didn't need to go everywhere in life with 15 cheerleaders saying, you can do it, you can do it. I played football back in the hood. <laughs> football, football, forgive me if that's politically incorrect, but it's whatever, it was Baltimore. And cheerleaders back there were a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> out here in Howard County, no offense. Howard County cheerleaders like, yay, you can do it, go for it, woo! -hoo. Back in Baltimore, they were like, boom, dynamite. <laughs> Said boom, dynamite. Uh. Said tick, 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 tick. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all were those cheerleaders. <laughs> What if we were the type of Christians that everywhere we went, we didn't need people behind us saying, you can do it, dynamite, you can do. What if we had that inside of us and we knew that it's in God that I live and have my being and I don't need somebody else to validate me so thus I can humble myself so that we can get this back on the right track. If you're struggling taking the first step, it's because you have not truly found your identity in Christ. Second thing is write this down. <laughs> Forgive, but verify. <laughs> Forgive, I love this. 
So, so, so Jacob and Esau, they're hugging and they're crying and the wives are like, are we good? I think we're good. He might be good, but when he comes back home, I'm going to tell him, you put me up front to die, we ain't going to deal with that. <laughs> so Esau says, my brother, I'm so glad that you're back. Let's go home. And Jacob said, ah, you go on ahead. He said, no, 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 I want to go with you. He said, no, and he blamed the women and the children and the goats and the sheep. He's like, oh, you got all these things. We're going to take a long time. I don't want to keep you. Just go ahead. Jesus said, okay, 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 I'll leave my soldiers with you. He's like, the ones with the swords? <laughs> no, that's okay. He said, go on to Sierra, and I'm going to come along slowly, and I'm going to catch up with you. And I don't have time to read all the verses. Do it in your own. It's in Genesis 33. But the Bible says that Esau went on to Sierra, waiting for Jacob to come, and Jacob went to Sokoth. Sierra is nowhere close to Sokoth. Jacob was still dealing with the whole manipulation and lying thing. He, he was delivered. He just wasn't walking all free yet. <laughs> he lied to his brother. And he moved to Sokith, and I actually looked it up on the map. Not only is Sokith not anywhere close to Sierra, there's actually a sea in between. And the Bible says that after that Jacob had lived in Sokith for a number of years, then he moved to a city named Shechem. And I looked up Shechem, and I discovered that Shechem was just a little bit closer to Sierra than Sokoth, but not that much closer. And all of a sudden, it struck me. Jacob said, I forgive you, but I need to make sure that you're not still homicidal before I let you back into my life. Can we have a little bit of fun here? I don't think that Jacob was concerned about his life. I think Jacob was concerned about his sons marrying his brother's daughters. Because you see, the night before this reconciliation happened, Jacob wrestled with Jesus himself. Read it. It is amazing. Jesus in the Old Testament. What? What I've discovered, though, is that when I pursue Jesus with all-out desperations, he will show up in places that he's not even supposed to be. But the Bible says because Jacob was desperate for God to touch him, that not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord, which is none other than Jesus himself, showed up and wrestled all night long with Jacob. And Jacob said, I will not release you until you bless me. And I love how Jesus responded to Jacob. He said, you want a blessing? Tell me what your name is. You got to understand, for Jacob's entire life, he was lying about his name. He told his dad that his name was Esau. He kept on telling people that he was someone that he was not. And what God was saying to Jacob is, I want to bless you, but I cannot bless who you pretend to be. I can only bless who I made you to be. So until you come clean with me and let me know who you actually are, I can't bless you. What's your name? My name is Dream Team member who's still smoking weed. What's your name? My name is Connect Group Host. is still battling with depression. What's your name? My name's Preacher, who's sometimes confident, sometimes insecure. Now I can bless you. As long as we try to save face in front of God, he said, I have nothing for you. He said, you'll seek me and you'll find me, but you will only find me when you seek me with all your heart. So he looked at Jesus and said, my name is Jacob. And he said, that's who you used to be when you were a liar and manipulator, but that's not who you are anymore because you've come clean in me. So I'm going to give you a new name and a new identity. Your name shall not be Jacob. You are now Israel because I will make you and your children's children a mighty nation. That's what happened the night before he ran into Esau. God changed his name to Israel. And you kind of know the story, even though you don't know the story. You know there's 12 tribes of Israel, right? Well, those were the 12 sons of Jacob. 
And Jacob understood that my sons are not sons. They're tribes that are going to become a nation, that out of these boys, Jesus himself is going to be born. But here's the problem. If my sons, who are my seed, who are Israel, marry Esau's sons, which are not God's seed, that's Edom, they're going to mess up the prophecy over their life, and it won't come to pass. So I can't get too close to him because he's going to mess up what God has placed inside of me. You have to understand that there are people that are unintentionally ordained by Satan to kill the promise that God has placed in your life. And you have to understand, I will forgive you, but I'm going to have healthy boundaries in my life that is going to keep. And here's how it happens. That sounds really intense, right? That whole emotional terrorist <laughs> That's a lot. I was asking my assistant, I was like, should I name it that? She's like, that's a lot. I was like, I know, that's why I named it that. There are people who are travel agents for guilt trips. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Just let it sink in. Every time you get around them, they tell you about what you didn't do and what you shouldn't do and how you should have done this. And if it's not you, they're talking about somebody you know. Well, you know your brother or your sister. Or your, they don't ever call me anymore. It's not like I didn't give birth to them. They forgot about me and just leave me out here to die. Just, I mean, just. <laughs> and they're not intentionally bad or evil people, but it's just that because of the bitterness in their heart, their words are actually aborting the promise that God has placed inside of you. So now you've found the right person. You're dating a man or woman of God or you're married to a man or woman of God. You guys are pursuing the destiny that God has for you. You are conquering all that God has for you. And then you get around that family member and they say, you know, that's what's right now, but it's not forever. You know, blood's thicker than water. No, it's not. <laughs> what God has joined together is thicker than everything. And stop telling me that family is all that I can rely on because that's my new family. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have boundaries before until I can figure out, are you going to attack my dreams or are you going to encourage them? I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a dreamer. Any, any dreamers in here, you, you just, you, just you, you, you conquer one hill and you're just after the next. But the only problem with me is and I've, I've matured and I've grown a lot, but, but, but I've always been a dreamer. And I used to be a dreamer with a big mouth. It's good to be a dreamer. It's not good to be a dreamer with a big mouth. Dreamers with big mouths, you tell people what you're going to do before you even do it. Just shut up and do it. Just. But I remember being 16 and telling people, man, one day I'm going to be preaching in front of thousands. God's going to bring revival to the city. God's going to do this and God's going to do that. And I was seeing visions and dreams and all that. And I was telling all these people what God's going to do. And, and, and it's amazing how people can kill your dreams without even saying anything. It's one thing to say, oh, that's never going to happen. You? No. But it, it's, it's completely different. Thing. Man, God's going to do this. And they go this. <laughs> what? Or, or, they, or, or they say, hmm. And it's kind of this, oh, you little naive little person. You haven't lived long. Wait till life starts. Wait till life happens. Wait till you, oh, you're going to get out of debt. <laughs> you cut up all your credit cards. <laughs> okay, you'll be back. <laughs> so what I've discovered is what the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 14, guard your heart above all else, for out of it flows the issues of Reconciliation is, yes, we are going to love each other, but I have to be certain that you're not going to attack the promises of God on my life. And when I figure that out, then we can do life together. When you're pursuing what I'm pursuing. By the way, I always say we're prideful, so we always take the victim role instead of the victor role or whatever it may be. This is just a sign. Stop killing other people's dreams. Stop. Look, there's always a downside to every dream. That's why you have to fight for it. No one needs you to be the person that always points out the barriers. They'll figure it out when they hit that wall. <laughs> Wives, this is great. Can I just help you out real quick? I don't know if you want my help. I'm help you out anyway. Let your husband say a lot of things about you, but don't ever let him say you didn't believe in him. You can do it. 
You, oh, I, even if it's the dumbest idea in the world, the Holy Spirit will let him know. Like, just, just, you, I just, I just, I just love the way you're dreaming. I just, I just love the way you're, oh man, I'm so grateful to be connected to somebody who is not willing to settle, but is believing that God can do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask, think, or imagine. What if we were a church that celebrated each other's dreams and didn't tear them down? What if we were a church that, yes, I know there's going to be battles, I know there's going to be mountains, I know there's going to be hills, but if you're going for it, I'm right there behind you yelling and screaming, you can do it in Christ, you can do all things. Last thing is this, write this down, bless them, no matter what bless them no matter what can I can I flip the script just for a second and we gonna land this plane so Esau was mad at Jacob because Jacob stole the father's blessing lied about Esau and then when dad died Esau said I'm gonna kill you and Jacob ran you guys caught all of that story right Esau was supposed to get two-thirds of their father's wealth. Jacob was supposed to get one-third of the father's wealth. Somebody say, I got all that. When Jacob was running for his life, he got nothing. He snuck out in the middle of the night and ran for his life. We know he had nothing because the Bible says the first night, the only thing he could find to sleep on was a rock. It is hard times when a rock is the most comfortable. So because Jacob tried to take advantage of Esau, Esau went from deserving two-thirds of his father's wealth to getting 100% of his father's wealth. If we could just understand, the more wrong you do to me, the more blessed I am in God. <laughs> Bible says this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. You guys have that verse? Can you fill it up there? Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. And it says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We, we, we have a habit. If, if you play, I'll stop. <laughs> Go ahead and play, and I'll stop this message. That's not true, but we'll try it. We always read this verse, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. We think that means that you're going to be persecuted for preaching the gospel. It's not what it said. It said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. What's righteousness? Righteousness is right standing with God, acting and responding like God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for responding like God because God blesses that type of person which means to me that there is a blessing for me when someone curses me, offends me, and I respond in a godly manner. If they had never offended me, I would have no opportunity to respond in a godly manner, and I would have missed out on that blessing. That blessing only came because of their offense and my response to their offense. So in fact, what they intended for evil, like Joseph said, is actually what promoted me into the position that I am right now. So whether you meant it for my good or bad, it doesn't matter because God makes all things things work together for my good according to his blessings and according to his riches so go ahead and talk about me go ahead and curse me all you're doing is setting me up for more blessing as long as long as I respond with righteousness so my job is to bless them no matter what. If they want to reconcile, bless them. If they spit in your face, bless them. If they say, I want nothing to do with them, bless them. If they don't answer your call, that's okay. Because the more adverse situations you face, the more opportunity you have to respond like Christ. And it's that response of humility. It's that response of godliness. The Bible says that it's what promotes you and exalts you. When I humble myself, Self, it's when he exalts me when I turn the other cheek it's when he what if I could see my father not being there as a blessing in disguise that'll make you think and that's the end of the message so I can't even unpack that you just gotta go home and do it down on your own <laughs> what if I got over 
you didn't and you said and I wish you were and and I got into my mind that's what set me up for the blessing that I'm walking in that's what posi- <laughs> that's what God ended up to use to make me who I am thank you thank you thank you thank you I, I, I actually oh what God is doing in my life to my greatest supporters and my greatest adversaries. Thank you. I I needed you at the most difficult time in my life. And because you were not there, I learned how to rely on God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When we realize because it's in him that I live and move and have my plane, it doesn't matter. Come hell or high water, it's going to work out for my good. He's with me. He's got me. He's ordered my steps. He said that he will not let me fall, that he will not let me trip, that he will not let me stumble, that it is him that is holding me up and enabling me to stand. And because of that, I don't need you to pay for what you've done to me. I don't need for you to come back and grovel. Let's just move forward. Let's encourage one of each other. Let me bless you because I'm telling you I'm good. God's been too good to me. So let's do life together. Because I'm going to give him a praise in this place. Jesus, we're grateful. We're thankful. God, that there's healing that's taking place in this moment. God, we're able to say thank you for tragedies, not that they came, but God, for what you did through them. God, I'm praying that you would give us the heart of Jacob, a heart of humility, that we could take the first step.